Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dermot Torney, and I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Law and Government at Dublin City University. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event. We are delighted to be joined by Jean-Marc Simon, Executive Director of Zero Waste Europe, and I would like to thank him for being so generous with his time today. Jean-Marc Simon is the Executive Director of Zero Waste Europe, a Brussels-based NGO that operates as a knowledge network and advocacy group. It works with 400 municipalities in 24 countries with the mission of redesigning our relationship with resources. Mr. Simon is a member of the steering committee of the Break Free from Plastic movement. He's the author of many influential articles uh, such as the Zero Waste Master Plan for Cities and also several books, including Zero Waste, How to Reactivate the Economy Without Trashing the Planet and It's Plastic Stupid. Mr. Simon has a background in economics with uh, and considerable experience of working with governmental and non-governmental organizations in the field of good governance, new economics, uh, social justice, and the environment. The title of today's address is A Zero Waste Vision for Europe. Mr. Simon will deliver a keynote address of approximately 20 minutes or so. After his presentation, we will go into a Q&A session with you, our audience. You can join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. I would respectfully ask that you identify yourself and affiliation when you ask a question. A reminder also that today, both today's presentation and Q&A session are on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Uh, and with that, Mr. Simon, you're most welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dermot. And thank you, IIEA, for, the, for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you from Brussels today. Um, and uh, to start this uh, conversation, which I'll try to be a bit uh, provocative about what is, I think, what is the state of play and uh, and the way forward, I think, to address the circular economy in Europe and, and striving for a zero waste uh, Europe. So first of all, where are we today? Um, if we look back uh, in the last 30 years, uh, the truth is that um, there's uh, good news and there's bad news. On one hand, Europe has reduced the amount of waste that we have been sending to landfilling by 30%, and we have managed to double the amount of uh, waste that we recycle, but we have also doubled the amount of waste that we burn in incineration facilities. The bad news is that um, we are generating more waste than ever, and that uh, reuse, refill, like the, what is at the top of the waste hierarchy, well, you know, that is like uh, prevention, reuse, recycle, and, and disposal. The, the top of the hierarchy, actually, there's not much being going, uh, going on up there. And um, in other words, the bottom of the hierarchy has been getting fatter. Yes, we landfill less, but we burn more and we generate more waste. So the situation today is that Europe is mainly a consumer of disposable items, not all of them very good quality, which are produced on the other side of the world. And the quantity and the quality of our employment as a result uh, is decreasing. Um, it's interesting to see how fertility rates have helped in the last 40 years in Europe because our exposure to, to chemicals and, and our lifestyle, and as I said, we generate more waste than ever. Um, and what it comes uh, strikingly uh, surprising as this is, uh, as this is that we have behind us decades of waste legislation and environmental legislation. Um, and yet the emissions and the production and the disposal side continue to increase. Why is this happening? Um, sadly, it continues to happen because um, generating waste, it makes economic sense. Uh, our economy, as you know, is based on maximizing throughput instead of maximizing well-being, which means that um, it's, it's, it's good if companies sell more. It's bad if stuff lasts longer because that means that companies uh, will not get to sell as much. Um, and this very quick uh, summary is... And you can find it, uh, the details in 30 to 40 years of European legislation. Why 
uh, otherwise would, would we have a guarantee of two years when you buy a fridge or a durable good like a dishwasher when actually these goods are supposed to last longer? Um, why um, don't we have uh, any focus on, re there's no legislation on reuse or prevention and all the waste legislation in Europe and at the national level is looking at how do we recycle, how do we incinerate, how do we regulate emissions, but we don't deal with actually the, the root uh, causes um, of the problem. Why, for example, the glass industry um, prefers to sell single-use uh, glass, which is the, the material with the highest environmental footprint instead of pushing for refillable uh, bottles. Well, of course, because if for every bottle that is refilled is 30 bottles less that they will be selling because of you know, refillable packaging. Many times the producer will get to sell less. So I just repeat, um, it's, uh, it's a legislation and it's an economy that is wired for linearity. And, and I think the challenge we have this day is actually that we, we know that we are in a crisis and we need to undo all this legislation and we need to, um, to make actually that doing the wrong thing um, sh uh, should be more expensive and more difficult than doing the right thing. What we cannot expect if, if, is that if doing the wrong thing is easier and cheaper than doing the right thing, the companies or the consumers are going to go against economic or like uh, easiness uh, incentives. And that's the situation today. The good news is that um, in Europe, we had an epiphany with this uh, when the circular economy back in 2014 was, uh, was proposed, um, in which it was very clearly stated that we cannot run a linear economy in a finite planet. This is, again, was nothing new because there's uh, uh, the limits to growth of the Club of Rome was published in the 1970s. Um, but well, it was the realization that actually that needed to be enshrined in European policy. Um, the challenge here is that for, I would claim that for almost everyone, except for some industry front runners, some visionary um, uh, policymakers and change makers in the NGO and research and academia, um, most people thought that the circular economy was just a new buzzword was coming to replace the green economy or sustainability, which basically had been so, so much greenwashing going on that they had lost all its meaning. And I think that that's, that has been the case until now. But what has changed? I think uh, we are entering a completely new era in the sense, because we are seeing how the, the global supply chains are being disrupted. We're seeing how there's a shortage in, in microchips, a shortage in toys, uh, a shortage in gas, electricity, is, prices are going up. Um, there's a shortage of construction materials, the price of transport of, transport of metals, of wheat are increasing. And um, I think for me, what that reflects actually that, well, we, have, we are past the peak oil and the gas oil. And if we believe that in the future, energy is going to be more expensive, it means that everything will be more expensive. So what that means for the circular economy, I think for what topic that concerns us today is that finally the circular economy or the zero waste is actually touching all of us. All citizens and all companies in Europe are today suffering the high prices um, of energy is suffering the consequences of climate change, um, et cetera, which means that, well, this is not only about uh, policy making. It's about, I would say, almost uh, crisis management. And again, uh, transitioning from a linear, socially unfair and polluting economy to a circular, toxic, free, fair society is not something that can be done overnight. And, uh, and the fact today, is that most of us, I would say all of us, have our homes filled with toxic chemicals present in packaging, furniture, floorings, etc. We don't have access to locally produced seasonal food or are able to make responsible choices when we're buying clothes, IT equipment, toys, etc. So when shopping, it's not possible to know whether a product is safe, repairable, recyclable, or durable. And all of this needs to change. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the challenge to get to a zero waste era. Um, because we need to understand that, um, that the circular economy is a system, whether we like it or not. And it's not a product that is circular, or it's not the, waste, the way we handle the waste that is circular. Not because you make a product recyclable that is going to be recycled. Not because you, make, you collect something separately and you recycle it, that that is circular. Um, what, what 
uh, it's it's the whole setup together that that is circular, and that's the complexity of uh, that that we're dealing with, and and I think that that is that is the challenge. That the fact that the EU needs to adopt a multidimensional approach to tackle the waste problem, but not only the waste problem. I think I would say it's also the the economic uh, challenges, and the policymakers need to replace half a century of legislation and economic incentives favoring disposability with a new paradigm resource management. Um, so I think that uh, the journey matters, but also the, the speed at which we are traveling matters. And I have the feeling when you look at legislation and when we look at uh, policymaking these days, the faster we need to go, the slower we move. Um, as you know, if you're familiar with uh, policymaking in the EU, it takes between five to 10 years between like an issue is detected to actually the legislation is passed, is transposed, is enforced, if it is ever enforced. And as a result, uh, today we're working on legislation that is from 2030, we should have packaging that will be recyclable and reusable, or by 2050, we should achieve carbon neutrality. Which in other words, what it means is that nothing needs to change in the next year or two. I mean, of course, you're going to have uh, front runners in the industry that are going to do, be doing everything right. But most of the people, most of the industry, if it's only because of legislation, they're not going to start moving. And as we've seen on the other side, we see how the reality today is that energy prices, uh, resource scarcity is hitting us. So the legislation is going to slow for the speed of change uh, that we need. And, um, and what we're seeing, uh, if we look at the European policymaking, is, um, is rather the opposite. Um, we, ha we have the example of, of the corona crisis, of something that where we were not prepared. And when emergency arrives, Legislation didn't matter because it meant that the European Commission had to improvise a common response, uh, coordinating travel measures, the production and purchase of vaccines, um, stockpiling personal protective equipment and ventilators, etc. That is not uh, legislation. That's a different kind of intervention. And I believe that the dramatic events of last summer caused by climate change, energy prices, and stability of supplies, etc., calls for changing gears. And the question, and I, leave, I go there to my next point is, do we have the right tools in policy making or in the way our governance is structured today to facilitate this transition? And I would argue that policy making as usual um, is necessary, but it's still insufficient because um, creating the rules for markets to operate um, works in times of certain stability. But if something we know, and the corona crisis is an example, is that, uh, markets don't function well in crisis situations. What happens in a crisis situation is that the state needs to intervene and actually you need to take the lead, be it a war, be it a, you know, uh, a pandemic, be it a national disaster, et cetera. And I think that because of the multidimensionality of the solution, and precisely because there's no solution in one sector, in one company, but actually a solution that needs to be systemic, we need to have a European Union that does more than just framing conversations, and setting goals. We need to, Yes, facilitate, but we need a, a leader that ensures that the transition happens and happens soon and in the right way. So it's great to have the microchip uh, strategy, digital security strategy, etc. But as we see, the scarcity of uh, of all these materials, of spare parts for cars and for production, etc., is happening today. And the legislation we pass today on circular economy is not going to come in time to actually to address all of this. So if in the future. Uh, we need to decide whether we, uh, the few microchips we have available need to go to playstations or to hospital equipment. Um, who is going to decide that? Are we going to leave that to the market or we need to actually change gears and address this? And if this is really a crisis situation, um, is the European Commission equipped to do this? Uh, there's less than 300 people in the European Commission working on circular economy. At the local level, actually, uh, the uh, the enforcement is rather weak, and we don't have many resources to do that. So when the resource scarcity crisis hits us, um, do we have the infrastructure, do we have the governance to intervene on that? Um, I think uh, that that requires uh, rethinking uh, governance in the way we do policy making and policy intervention. I mean, of course, um, if we look at, the, at, at policy making concretely, what, what needs to happen what, what we are advocating is that, um, that prevention and reuse need to become the new normal. Clearly, um, 
having uh, reuse quotas for packaging, but also for other materials, made from construction materials to, to clothing, etc. cetera, uh, deposit and, and refund uh, systems standards for packaging and for other products so that we can know uh, how to better uh, repair them, refill them, wash them, uh, etc., are important. We're going to need new infrastructure as well, because for the same reason as you don't run trains on roads, you cannot run a circular economy on the linear economy infrastructure. And that requires new infrastructure. Uh, the recycling infrastructure, the collection infrastructure is not useful for a, a economy that is based on circularity, which stuff is reused, is repaired, etc. We need transparency. We need to have uh, product passports, but we also we need to link the product passports to some sort of a material budget per capita or some sort of a connection between what is the climate agenda, the resources available, and the consumption that we can have uh, for people. Um, and we need to stop focusing really on like reducing landfilling or incineration and really focus on how do we generate less, less waste. Um, I will say it's raining here. Yeah. As I said before, I think it's important to also invest in enforcement capacity. Um, for example, in 2023, the European Union needs to enforce separate collection of bio waste. I think this is a big opportunity. There's 80 million tons of uh, food scraps that are not being collected today in Europe that end up in landfills and incinerators. They could be, this could be used to for many applications, creating, uh, generating biogas, compost, or even bioplastics, and, and these uh, things that we are missing. But how are we going to make sure that these and there's other examples, are we going to take advantage of this opportunity? And we are going to really um, make this resource um, circular. So um, I could uh, go a lot more detail into the policy proposals that, uh, that I think are necessary. But again, uh, just to remind that we we're talking about legislation that will be entering into a force. Well, probably I think it's going to be too late. So I think we need to, to start moving. And it, it's good to see how countries such as France, for example, is already having uh, conversations about like how to implement infrastructure for, for reuse, but actually that with concrete targets, um, et cetera. And it's good to see that different countries also are taking some measures here and there. But what I'm seeing is like scattered and coordinated efforts and the European Commission completely um, overwhelmed by the situation. We think at the same time as when we need them the most, how burnout rates in the uh, among civil servants in these units are quite high. We are seeing how legislation is being delayed. For example, the revision of the packaging and package waste directive has been delayed again. The same for the sustainable product initiative. We are seeing as well how the quality of impact assessments and other quality uh, and processes in the commission are like being duplicated and not being very efficient which is a clear sign that I think something needs to change at the, at the governance level. Just to conclude, um, from Zero Waste Europe, we try to apply this logic to ourselves. And uh, as it has been presented at the beginning, we are working with more than 400 municipalities in Europe, um, trying to uh, implement these solutions. We have certification for Zero Waste Cities. Um, and we are happy to see how actually, when some countries are dragging their feet at the local level, some municipalities, are, are really like stepping up and creating the infrastructure for change uh, to happen. We are also helping uh, facilitate conversations among uh, the industry to build all of this. Um, and the opportunities are out there. Um, yet we are just an NGO and we are mobilizing lots of uh, people. We are mobilizing, yes, for example, the principal plastic movement here in Europe. Uh, we do what we can. But I think we're going to need much more if it's true that we're entering really the time of scarcity of resources and a high energy prices, which for me kind of changes the, the rules of the game. And I'm convinced we're going to see many changes in the coming years. And um, of course, it would be good if we would be better prepared, but one is never prepared for a crisis. Problem this time is that I think that we have the environmental, social, economic, and political crisis all hitting us at the same time. And it's hard to be prepared for that. So with or without legislation, we will need to redesign the way we deal with resources in the coming years. And um, sorry for the a bit pessimistic uh, 
uh, outline, but I want to see this as an opportunity to actually for, to change things for the better. I see that as an opportunity for civil society to work with industry, to work with policymakers, to work with investors, to um, actually rethink the way we organize our production and consumption in order for Europe to be a lot more resilient, a lot more sustainable, and, and, and providing quality jobs for, for the people. So if I would con conclude using a Game of Thrones analogy, uh, it feels like winter is coming. So we, we need to, to get ready. Thank you.